Hello. Thank you for joining us today in the Cards Against Humanity Theater for Matriarchy, Explaining the Kardashians. And you're welcome for having you. <laughs> you may have come here with questions about the Kardashians, but you will leave with answers about yourselves. <laughs> and now I would like to introduce resident expert, Carly Smiley, expert in what? The yes. Kardashians. Kardashians. No. Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you for attending. Thank you for, <laughs> for that beautiful introduction. You're welcome. Um, yes, as, as Trin stated, this is Modern Matriarchy, Kardashian Family 101. I'm Carly Smiley. I work for Cards Against Humanity and Black Box, and I'm just very honored to have you here. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special thanks um, to some people that have helped me out immensely with this project. Uh, Siobhan Thompson, Holly Chernobyl, and of course my sister, Chelsea Smiley. So thank you very much. Now, we are here to discuss the Kardashians, which, as we all know, casual, hilarious fun, right? <laughs> fun to mock the Kardashians. They don't deserve our respect. They're just pop culture. <laughs> I'm afraid you're wrong. You need to get out if you feel this way. This is an academic discussion. I am setting the tone right now in this moment. We are here to learn about ourselves and our culture. So I'm going to set the ground rules right off the bat. This is a respectful discussion. Questioning and criticism are welcome. We don't need to worship these people. We need to learn from them. So if anyone has questions, I would like to think of this as a lecture discussion. Feel free to pop in and out. Test my knowledge. <laughs> We're coming at these people with a position of empathy. Um, and with that, no prior Kardashian knowledge is necessary. So if you're lost, if you're an old trying to catch up with all of it's totally fine. We'll give you an intro. Um, I do ask that we refrain from name calling. This is an academic discussion. Um, except, of course, for Tyga, the worst rapper ever, and a total idiot. Everyone hates him. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I'll begin with a brief overview of what I'm hoping to talk about. Matriarchy, what I like to call the fame machine, and of course, narrative and semiotic structure in modern media. Um, as we go through this, again, uh, I'd like you to learn about yourself, and I'd like to ask you questions that I then answer. <laughs> so let's begin. Uh, matriarchy and capital. There's almost no other woman in the world who better simplifies this than Chris Jenner. Um, so to begin, for our olds out there, this is a family tree of the original Kardashians, uh, of course, with Kris Jenner, our matriarch at the top, Robert Kardashian Sr., and then the four children, Courtney, Kim, Chloe, and Karab, as I like to call them, <laughs> Rob Kardashian. <laughs> so if we think about this original relationship between Kris Jenner and Robert Kardashian Sr., um, it's actually an interesting thing. It marks a dated time in the Kardashian history. So Robert Kardashian Sr. was famous in his own right as an important lawyer in the O.J. Simpson murder case, or trial, as some people say. Um, <laughs> he was a third generation Armenian American. And I think what's interesting in this fact about Robert Kardashian is we see that long before Kim's sex tape, the Kardashians were rising in notoriety and wealth, particularly in Hollywood. Um, also in this picture of Kris Jenner, I think we see an earlier side to the Kris we know today. She was characterized, and still is, as being vital and energetic, a businesswoman. And although she was happy with Robert Kardashian for many years, uh, her several very gaudy affairs broke off their relationship. Um, when he did die in 2003 from esophageal cancer, they were on very good terms. So again, this is the Kardashian side of the family. On the far left, we have Rob, Kris, our matriarch, Kim, and then Chloe and Courtney, of course. The other side of the family, again, starting with Chris, is the Jenners. So we have, of course, Chris and Caitlyn Jenner forming the founders of this side of the family, and Kendall and Kylie, again, um, beautiful women, members of a family, bigger for themselves. Um, so while Caitlyn Jenner has been in the media quite frequently lately, we don't have quite the time to dive into everything with her transition, but I will say, that the individual definitions of femininity in the Kardashian and Jenner families um, are very important in our understanding of matriarchy. And I think Caitlyn Jenner absolutely has an important individual definition and one that's in discussion with others of the Kardashian family. So here again, we have the uh, Jenner side with Kendall, Chris, and Kylie. 
And what you'll notice about both the Kendall and the Kardashian families is the head, Kris Jenner, <laughs> the matriarch of both families. When we think, what makes a Kardashian? Why is someone famous for being a Kardashian? It's not the same. It's not their family, it's Kris Jenner. It's her machine, it's her marketing prowess, it's her ability. She is the king maker, or the queen maker, the Kardashian family. And Kris is not only the social and emotional leader of the Kardashians, she's also the economic leader. I don't know if you know this, but she manages the careers of all six of her children. Um, and while she may have initially gained notoriety from a position of wealth and her marriages to men, uh, she's evolved her identity into an independent one of her own, which is a pattern we will see repeated throughout many of the Kardashian women. The New York Times actually said in 2015 in their profile of Kris Jenner, she is an executive producer of Keeping Up with the Kardashians and its summer spinoffs. Without Kris, Kim might not have pulled in a reported $28 million in 2014. Kendall wouldn't necessarily be an in-demand model walking runways for Chanel and Marc Jacobs and appearing on the covers of Allure and Harper's, Harper's Bazaar. Harper's Bazaar. Uh, <laughs> and of course it goes on to list her many accomplishments in managing her children's careers, but it ends with a statement that I find very resonative, which is, the thing is, no one in her family knew what they were doing until Chris took charge. To me, this is a very transgressive idea of matriarchy and femininity. We have these kind of old, more traditional ideations of what femininity is. It's being a mother, it's leading this family emotionally. But also she's claiming power within a patriarchal and capitalistic system. In an economic way, Chris is a very powerful woman, perhaps the most powerful of all the Kardashians. Which leads us now to another matriarch and perhaps the heir to Chris's throne, Kim Kardashian herself. When I think of Kim, I think of what I like to call the fame machine, which is a bit of a nebulous concept, but I'd like to dive in with all of us together. <laughs> so if we begin, there are many different things when we think of Kim, many different concepts, uh, fame, capital, beauty, race, sexuality, family, and they all help to create a perception of her. Um, so to honestly define the fame machine, I think this is a good graphic to represent it, it's this idea that's often characterized as, oh, the Kardashians are famous for being famous. They don't have any real talent or skill, as Chris obviously disproves here. Um, but the New York Times, again, has a very specific um, description of what this fame actually is. New York Times writes, they're famous for the industry that they've created. The Kardashian-Jenner mega complex, which has not just invaded the culture, but metastasized into it, with the family members emerging as legitimate people, business people. That was in 2015. So with that definition in mind, when we return to this ideation of Kim, I think we can see a lot of these different factors that come together to create a momentum of fame, publicity, marketing. Essentially, there's a shift, and this is my hypothesis with specifically Kim. Kim has represented a shift in turning the private and the personal to the public. I think we see that in her sexuality, her family, her beauty, and her social media presence, and we'll dive into these things as we go. Um, but it is worthy to note that the Kardashians were not the first people to create a fame machine or to engage with one. Um, I think that the early reality TV stars are great models, and uh, an unexpected mentor, one might say, to Kim Kardashian was Paris Hilton. So I don't know if you know this, but Kim worked for many years as an assistant to Paris Hilton. Um, she was sidelined to all of Paris's ups and downs, um, and I think that fact in itself does show an important facet of the Kardashian family, and it's that they did come from a place of relative privilege. They had connections, Kim was able to be sidelined on this world before she was fully immersed in it. I would theorize that Kim has learned a lot from her experiences and her observations of Paris. And Paris Hilton, along with many other celebrities, uh, have a formulation, I would say, of gaining this kind of momentum. It has a lot of different components, but I think ones that come to mind immediately are social media, club appearances, businesses with your name that you're investing money into, that kind of capital, um, often dating someone more famous than you or someone with some kind of recognition and credibility. And then that eventually coalesces into your own brand, your own reality show, your own fame. That momentum picks up enough that you're an independent woman yourself, kind of like Kris Jenner. Um, and what I think is very interesting specifically when comparing Paris and Kim is the variations on this formula that these two women take. Paris Hilton, um, as we remember in Paris's TV sh reality show about finding her BFF, um, was kind of a lone wolf. Like she had trouble with these sort of relationships. She wasn't known for her friendships or her family. An important variation that Kim Kardashian emphasizes 
is the integration of family into the fame machine. Um, Paris may not be too happy with the fame that the Kardashians have achieved, but that's okay. Um, regardless, we see this integration of family. Um, and I think this is interesting in a lot of ways. In some sense, it's a shrewd business move. With each new member that's integrated into the zeitgeist, we increase the overall clout of the Kardashians, of Kim herself, what's marketable, people that we can identify with. Um, and in this photo, I think we can also see there's an interesting sort of emotional component. Uh, this is the Kardashian Christmas card, which is taken every year. They're um, quite beautiful affairs, if I may editorialize for a moment. <laughs> um, <laughs> regardless. Uh, so in this integration of family into the fame machine, um, on one level, it's a shrewd business move. On another, it's an interesting uh, return to this idea of the private and the personal moving to the public. We now have the most intimate relationships in Kim Kardashian and the rest of the Kardashians' lives displayed for us in reality shows. It's this emotional um, support that perhaps has been hidden in terms of the past of fame brought into the spotlight. Um, again, it's this shifting. And in this photo, I think we can uh, start to move on to the next topic I'd like to talk about today. Uh, there is a certain homogeneity in the looks of the Kardashian women and the looks they strive to achieve, not just in how they physically look. Um, and I want to talk about Kim Kardashian's beauty and how we think of her race. To me, these topics are absolutely intertwined. Um, as I mentioned before, Robert Kardashian Sr. was a third generation Armenian American. And if we ask, how does Kim Kardashian identify? How do we see her? She identifies herself as an Armenian woman. Here we see Kim and Chloe visiting the Armenian Genocide Memorial Complex in Armenia. So hopefully it would be just as simple as she's Armenian, that's how she identifies, um, and we can move on. But I think it's a lot more complicated than that. When we start to think about how we think of Kim Kardashian, particularly in this way, I think one thing we can agree on here is that there are different standards of beauty that vary, um, unfortunately. Like on a macroscopic scale, these often vary by race. So if we are to interpret Kim as a white passing person of color, then the standards by which we evaluate her beauty can subconsciously change. So as we think about Kim Kardashian's beauty, I think the white swimsuit pick is a good one to mull over. <laughs> one of the most famous selfies of all time, and of course, cannot be mentioned without Kanye West's wonderful response, heading home now. <laughs> I think we all can relate to the man. <laughs> Regardless, uh, in this photo, Let's talk about the beauty standards by which we evaluate Kim. Why do we call her beautiful? Why do we know her for her physical beauty? Um, I don't think it's as simplistic as to say, and of course this is all conjecture, these are questions for meditation. Um, I personally don't think it's as simplistic to say that Kim is white passing and therefore evaluated on white beauty standards. Um, rather, I would make an argument that Kim's beauty creates a palatable and tolerable otherness for mass media. She's white enough that she's not necessarily seen as other, it's comfortable and familiar for a dominant zeitgeist, but exotic enough that she can still be objectified for her otherness. And there are certain components of this photo, I think, that would emphasize that. Um, I think that Tina Fey summed it up best. All Beyonce and JLo have done is add to the laundry list of attributes women must have to qualify as beautiful. Now every girl is expected to have Caucasian blue eyes, full Spanish lips, a classic button nose, hairless Asian skin with a California tan, a Jamaican dance hall ass, long Swedish legs, small Japanese feet, the abs of a lesbian gym owner, the hips of a nine-year-old boy, the arms of Michelle Obama, and doll tits. I don't know what that means. The person closest to actually achieving this look is Kim Kardashian, who, as we know, was made by Russian scientists to sabotage our athletes. Um, I think this quote is important. It's, it's showing that complexity. It's not simple. It's, it's not simply that Kim conforms to a single beauty standard. And I think in empathizing with that, we can imagine some of the difficulty it must mean to be in that spotlight and within that fame machine, particularly when understanding the body. But if we talk about Kim Kardashian's body, I think it's important to discuss uh, the empowering moves that she's made within her career to use sex and her body as a tool of power. Kim Kardashian broke the internet. Um, as much as we've discussed our perception of her beauty, uh, this sexuality as a tool is something that we often see in careers of people similar to Kim. Uh, we can reference the infamous sex tape with Ray J, her nude shoots, uh, I quote Kim Kardashian, nude selfies till I die, um, which is great. But what we have here is sexuality frequently as a means of shame, frequently as a means of slut shaming women, but also as a means of value and publicity. And Kardashian wields her body and her sexuality in order to increase her clout and power. 
I would argue that it's similar to, to her integration of her family into her life to increase this momentum. Um, she's using every tool at her disposal and understanding specifically public reaction and reception to her actions. These are calculated acts. That's one of the major theses that I'd like to emphasize to you today, is that these people have an awareness and an intelligence of what they're doing. Um, to move on then, I'd like to discuss narrative and semiotic structure, and I think that the recent Kardashian feud with Black China is an incredible example of uh, media narrative. So the first uh, thing I think we need to acknowledge when discussing this is the essential unknowability of celebrity. And just as Kim turns away from us in this photo, we can never fully know her true internal life, her emotions, her sincerity. These are things we just don't have access to. Um, all we can really know is that, ostensibly, they exist, in some sense, whatever they are. So what we can know, though, is the story that's created around these figures, both by their individual actions and our expectations, which we manifest in the media and our portrayal and representation of them. So as we dive into the story, I'd first like to introduce you to our cast of characters. Uh, Kim K, our kingpin as always. Her husband, Kanye West, uh, a famous rapper. Sometimes uh, a little bit controversial. Um, we also have Amber Rose. Uh, Amber Rose, for those who may not know, is a very famous model and a video girl, which is a term for girls that are often seen in rap music videos and things like that. Uh, extremely well known. Um, also, the famous ex-girlfriend of Kanye West. She's the Mercutio in the story, if you will, to our Romeo. Black China. <laughs> Black China, also a model and video girl, um, is, you know, I, I struggle to editorialize here, but she has a, a sweetness and a strength that I, I wish to emphasize. Then we have Tyga, an idiot. <laughs> I hate Tyga. I am biased. Tyga's the worst. Um, he is also a rapper. Uh, he, eh, I'm just, I can't even turn around. Kylie, uh, then again, is, is another important character in this narrative. So remember, she is the youngest of the Jenners. And during the events of this following story, Tyga is 25, approximately, and Kylie is 17. Note that. <laughs> then, finally, we have our Juliet, Rob <laughs> Kardashian <laughs> Jr. <laughs> The fourth Kardashian, you remember the youngest Karab, as we said before, on the Kardashian side. Um, perhaps the least suited to fame. Uh, a bit of a recluse, been through some depression and some pain in a very public way. Sock designer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we will begin then in paradise. Uh, things, are, things are pretty simple. We have here Kim Kardashian posing with her good friend, Black China. Now, they're great friends, and frequently they go on double dates. Now, why is that? Because Black China is in a relationship with Tyga. A long one, I will say, around three years. Uh, Black China and Tyga are close friends with Kim Kardashian and Kanye. However, it's not all wonderful in paradise. Amber Rose and Black China are absolutely very close friends. Um, and they have an interesting and very similar career path. As I mentioned, they both began as strippers. And I think that they capitalized on the same kind of formula we discussed that we've seen variations on with. Paris and Chris and Kim with social media, club, club appearances, business that you're investing in, um, and again, using this dating to gain your own clout and momentum. Regardless, though, we will remember that Amber Rose and Kanye, famous exes, with a pretty hostile breakup. In fact, Amber Rose has frequently accused Kim Kardashian of uh, having infidelities and affairs with Kanye before they would have frequently broken up. So, we have Black China in the middle of these two wonderful and strong female friendships, and also in a relationship with the biggest idiot of all time, Taika. So they have a child together, King Cairo. Uh, they're together for three years. Taika engages. It's beautiful and happy until their engagement is suddenly broken off by Taika. Hmm. What could possibly motivate this man to leave a beautiful mother and businesswoman? It's interesting, the rumors swirled, but it might have something to do with Tyga throwing Kylie Jenner's 17th birthday party. Oh. <laughs> rumors spin, but we're not sure. Everyone's denying it. Everyone's like, oh, we're just friends. Kylie's like, I'm just friends. Tyga's like, I'm just friends. Until a faithful interview, <laughs> which I would like to show you now. <laughs> Hello, five, one. That was Tyga on. Um... You mentioned the title, you're definitely producing his album. Do you feel like his relationship with your sister-in-law is inappropriate? 
I think he, I think he got it early. I think he was smart. I told him he's red shirt. And I said, that's a great red shirt. And let's be clear, Russell was 35 when he met Kamara in 17. Yeah. I mean, I don't, you know. They close in age. South too, though, so I they close in age than a lot of relationships that I know. You know, he's twenty five. Should be eighteen in August. Like, yeah, I, I, I knew Tiger was smart. You know. <laughs> so after this, it was very hard to deny. <laughs> <laughs> Kanye, a controversial man, uh, came forward, and soon uh, things quickly escalated as Kylie and Tiger did announce their relationship bit by bit, Instagram <clears throat> post after Instagram post, which led to ultimately the eruption of this feud. And I say eruption, but it was a slow eruption, like a true volcano. Um, so again, I'll just go over this quickly. We have, of course, Kanye and Kim in a loving relationship, and now Kylie and Tyga in their newly announced relationship. Amber Rose and Black China, absolutely best friends. So now that Black China has been spurned by Tyga, Amber Rose and Black China are against this whole relationship, particularly Kylie. Now you remember that Amber already has beef with Kim and Kanye due to her being broken up. <laughs> and ultimately, oh gosh, <laughs> ultimately Kim is caught in the middle of this. Kim, friends with Black China, but half sister to Kylie, sides with the family as she predictably would, and the relationship, the friendship between Black China and Kim dissolves as we move forward. But now we return to our Juliet, Rob Kardashian. <laughs> if we think about Rob Kardashian's history in the Kardashian family, as I said, he's least suited to fame. I think that's pretty much an objective statement. Um, huh. Rob Kardashian, as he grew for several of the original seasons, was uh, quite involved with the Kardashian family and mm -hmm. adapted pretty well. But, you know, from our perspective as an audience to all of this, it's hard to tell which came first, uh, his depression or his pretty significant and fast weight gain. And obviously, you know, we've talked a lot about beauty standards and the position of empathy we have for the Kardashians, but gaining weight and being so frequently judged on your body compared on these things on such a public level can only be an extremely difficult thing to go through. And Rob Kardashian for, well, we can guess this and several of the reasons, uh, became quite reclusive. He wasn't on the show, he barely interacted with his family members, we just didn't see him in the public eye in the same way. He faded. Until Black China. <laughs> Rob and Black China, yes. <laughs> are now in relationship. <gasps> Once they announced it, all of a sudden, Rob had a Snapchat. I know that doesn't sound like a deal, but it's a huge deal. <laughs> Rob had a Snapchat. Uh, we started seeing him, we started seeing him in events, and what's more is we started seeing him happy. Um, we started seeing Rob Kardashian smiling and with this woman. Um, now obviously, as you'll remember, this is not okay or cool with the other Kardashian members, so it led to one of my favorite screenshots of all time. Kendall and Kylie Jenner scream at Rob Kardashian for re-gifting iPad to Black China. <laughs> this video is too long for us to watch here and now, but I promise you it is well worth your time. Um, so regardless, uh, I will say that as much as there was drama within, uh, within the family and addressing Rob, addressing Black China, the Kardashians do have a spirit of reconciliation. It's a pattern we've seen with uh, Amber Rose, with Black China. Uh, particularly, I think this is a moment when we see Kim stepping up into a matriarchal role, sitting down uh, Kylie and Black China and having them discuss what's actually happened. And at the end of the day, when we look at just Black China and Rob Kardashian, it's kind of a classic Cinderella story. Boy gains weight, <laughs> family heavily criticizes him for weight gain publicly, boy becomes recluse to fame and family, boy meets girl, uh, girl helps boy lose weight, become happy, Family reaccepts, boy. It's really a beautiful story. Uh, and I think that Kanye might say it best himself. Black China fucking Rob, help him with the weight. I wish my trainer would tell me what I overate. Mm -hmm. I think we all wish that, Kanye. Um, <laughs> it's beautiful. Uh, regardless, now it's time to look to the future. Now that we've seen this narrative and we've seen this structure, um, we see Black China with the only male heir to the Kardashian name in her belly now that they are engaged and Black China is pregnant. She carries the next generation of Kardashians. And it's interesting to see Black China, or as she will become, Angela Renee Kardashian, uh, use some of the same tools that the Kardashians used to become famous and to create this fame machine to gain her place at the table. Um, it's, to me, it's a fascinating progression. Um, and frankly, you know, we've talked about sincerity a bit in this talk and uh, how much we can really know them, and particularly Black China. I don't think we'll ever know whether she sincerely loves Rob Kardashian. I don't think we'll ever know that. 
But I think we can know that she, like the women who have gone before her, was absolutely aware of the consequences of her actions. This is either the greatest coup or the greatest love story of all time, to quote BuzzFeed. <laughs> um, and again, uh, when I look at this now, to take a step back from this family specifically, there's this question that we began with of why these people are famous. And to me, when I think about this, it makes sense. Because this is Game of Thrones. This is Shakespeare. <laughs> this is Machiavellian plots. Um, to me, it's fascinating that the Kardashians represent this political intrigue, like a kind of story people have been telling for years with betrayal and families and old school political marriages. Um, but it's all couched in kind of low art, like reality TV shows, BuzzFeed, things like that. And when I think about their stories in this way, like this short-term gratification that we have of social media and blogosphere and drama and reality TV, and you combine that with sort of the long-term investment that we take to each Kardashian, the actual politics of the family, it seems clear to me why we as a culture care about this. This is a new kind of media, a new kind of story structure. So I'd like to end with a beautiful gif um, from when Kim was 14 years old. And she states, when I'm famous and old, you're going to remember me as this beautiful little girl. And I don't know if that's true, but I do think we will remember Kim Kardashian. Thank you. Um, so I'd be happy to take questions from the audience or streamers or anyone who would like. Ooh, I see one from Lauren. Uh, I Just talk loud. Talk loud, and I'll repeat your question. Carly, why are the Kardashians often written off as dumb, shallow, stupid, etc.? <laughs> <laughs> why are they written off as stupid and shallow? Interesting. That's a very good question, Lauren. <laughs> yeah. Amazingly written. I would say <laughs> uh, that, firstly, I would say that we can suspect or misogyny, uh, particularly here. These are women within a low art field, uh, and I think, like, the choice of terms that we can use with them is really powerful and revealing. Like, gossip and drama and petty are meant to be derisive. They're meant to be demeaning. Um, when we talk about Game of Thrones, it's intrigue and it's politics. And I would argue that these are largely the same thing. Um, but I would say that, yes, there's, there's an element of misogyny and there's an element of representation. Um, I think they're also packaged to be shallow and dumb in certain ways, to be marketable, to be interesting to us, to be accessible. Yes? Uh, could you talk a little bit about Kim Kardashian's ability to manipulate and master the tabloid infrastructure and how that's impacted their growth? Absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, when I think of the Kardashians, I really do think of shrewd, like an intelligent and manipulative, not in a negative way. When we talk about tabloid structure, as you brought up, I think that what's interesting is that the Kardashians don't view tools of media as being below them. I think that's interesting for a lot of celebrities. What you'll see is they won't engage with tabloid culture. They're trying to rise above it. And I don't think the Kardashians do that. I think there's a very specific element of intentionality to their use of the tabloids. And in terms of um, how they interact with them in a manifested level, to me it's just genius. Like it's just fully understanding what it is. Kim fully understands what Snapchat is. Follow her on Snapchat, it will make your life better. That's why she gains these kinds of following. She knows what people, the kind of content people are looking for. And I think that's true of all the Kardashians. Hi, thanks for doing this. My <laughs> name is James. Hello. Uh, so, I have, so I have two questions. Of course. Um, first question is um, looking into how the media interprets specifically Kim Kardashian yes. and um, Amber Rose. Mm -hmm. A lot of times Amber Rose will get more criticism for a lot of the same actions, whether it's her selfies or yes. whether it's speaking up on um, slut culture, things of that nature. So the first question is, do you feel that Kim Kardashian used to her, uh, used to her advantage um, her sort of racial ambiguity to an adopting of traditionally black beauty standards. And second question is your insert of the Tina Fey quote. Yes. Um, so how do you feel about you inserting the Tina Fey quote, quote while she has usually a strong problem with adopting um, race and having those issues? 
in her personal media? Excellent questions, James. <laughs> I do this for a living. Yes. Uh, I think that, so I want to make sure I understand for the first question we're discussing uh, Kim's use of her racial ambiguity while still adopting um, features from other races, particularly like African American, I think is very emphasized. And then, of course, like the problematic nature of using a Tina Fey quote. Um, I think these both have to do with identity politics and my understanding of it. To begin, I would absolutely state that Kim is using her racial ambiguity. And I think that there's a very like interesting or very specific reason why women like Amber Rose and Black China are slut shamed, frankly, to a lot greater degree and with a lot harsher criticism than someone like Kim Kardashian. Um, frankly, I think it comes down to this nature of otherness. I think Kim is able to skate this line of racial ambiguity, so we're able to exotify but still feel comfortable with her. Um, but it's definitely a subject that I am learning more on every day. Um, and I do admire, in an intense sense, Amber Rose and Black China. Uh, in this picture, actually, right here, they were both wearing outfits together, and it's in the next one of Black China as well, which say words that they're often called. Uh, ho, slut, uh, gold digger. And I think this was an interesting moment of them very specifically addressing these kinds of concerns and these kinds of criticism that they're met with, slut shaming specifically. Um, I'm not super well versed on Tina Fey's actions. I have not stayed currently up to date with her. Um, but I think what I can say is that there's this interesting question of validity of a speaker versus validity of a statement. Um, and again, that's something I'm learning more on every day, and I'm happy to get many opinions on it. But frankly, I think what I'm hoping to emphasize with the use of the Tina Fey quote is this uh, multivariance of beauty standard, um, which I hope will rise above her specific and personal beliefs as important and influence influential as they are in pop culture. Thank you, James. Hello, Carly. Thanks okay. again for doing this talk. Of course. Um, so I have one question from Twitch and then two questions in my own. Let's Love start it. with a question from <laughs> Twitch. Um, Cher Vincent asks, could you please uh, go into more detail about the uh, weight loss of uh, Courtney and the weight loss of Rob and how it was uh, explored in the media? Sure, of course. Um, I will begin by saying I am a Kim emphasized Kardashianologist. So as, <laughs> as familiar as I am with Courtney and Rob, um, I'd like to speak more generally about weight loss in the Kardashian family. It's just a very public thing. Like again, we're taking every aspect of their bodies, this personal thing, this private thing, it's very public. I think the same can be said of their sexuality. And I think what's interesting about Courtney and Rob, and specifically with Rob, is that the, a lot of the criticism that the family had of Rob's weight gain was behind his back, but on a TV show. Like, there's this interesting, I think, tension between the gossip and the intrigue of their lives with the publicity of it. Um, it's kind of unavoidable, and I think in that sense I can see how sometimes in these difficult moments when they're being criticized for something like your body, which is, for so many of us, like a private thing, a personal thing, um, for them it's not. I can see why there's this retreat a lot of times from uh, a type of fame and a type of publicity. Um, right, my next question is, uh, I know that you mentioned earlier in your talk that uh, a lot of forms of femininity are represented in the Kardashian family. Absolutely. But, um, on surface level, it really appears to me that only like intense uh, makeup empire femininity is really explored. Um, could you explain a little bit more about what you mean? Absolutely. Um, first of all, I'd like to agree with you that there is a strain. While each woman in the Kardashian family has her individuality, there is um, a homogeneity that brings them together. Like we talked about their looks. Um, but I think femininity goes beyond uh, surface level too. That I think that's something that's very important to explore. Each Kardashian female and woman, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> each Kardashian woman uh, has a mix of femininity that I think brings in her personality, her opinions, her appearance, all these things that help us define gender. So I think that what I'd like to see is that their influence and their status as public figures can give us a more holistic idea of their expression of femininity. Kris Jenner, again, is someone I always go to as a reference for this. Um, while she is absolutely this um, makeup, marketing, and business queen, she's also a very emotional person, a very in-touch person. And in terms of femininity, too, I like to think that the Kardashians are very funny. I think they're extremely hilarious people, and I think they're intentionally funny. 
And I think that's a wonderful, often um, like passed over element of what makes someone feminine in a way. Or at least it's a part of their feminine expression. Thank you. Uh, last question, and this is from an anonymous asker. Uh, Carly, have you seen Kim's infamous sex tape? <laughs> oh my god, of course. Lots <laughs> <laughs> of times for research and for pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, uh, thank you guys so much. Oh, oh no. Mm -hmm. I was only adamant about asking it. Oh, Wait, uh, I was only adamant about asking, sorry, because I am normally too shy to ask questions and things like this, and I wrote it down. Hi, Maya. Uh, I would like to ask My name's Maya. Hello. Um, so this is um, similar to what James said, but more like point pointed question, I guess. Sure. Um, it's going to be robotic again, because I wrote it down. Um, is it possible that the Kardashian consistency with seeking romantic relationships with African Americans is also a strategy to continue to produce the ideation of beauty with the combination of supposed palatable European features and exoticized bodies? Continuing, are they using African Americans as a product or consumable ingredient for the continuation of their fame factor? It's a question that is absolutely valid. Um, to me, again, it comes to this moment of like, it's hard for me to speak to the intentions wholly of the Kardashians. Does Kim love Kanye? I'd like to think so. But the patterns that you're identifying are valid and they're present. And I do wonder how much of this is fame machine, how much of this is calculated, how much of their personal relationships are political, and particularly in terms of the patterns we see with race. Um, so to say the least, it's problematic and it's possible. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> um, great. Well, thank you guys so much. This has been so fun. Woo!